Sophisticated cyber attacks that could shut down Canadian oil and gas pipelines. Are we ready? I'm Mercedes Stevenson. Welcome to the West Block. From banks to pipelines and power grids to your cell phone company, the risk from Russia, China and hackers to services we depend on for our way of life and national security. Why Canada's top cybersecurity official is warning companies to be on the alert. And as MPs head home for the summer, a report card on the last session of Parliament. A Canadian intelligence agency is sounding the alarm that Russia may be stepping up its cyber attacks against Canada for supporting Ukraine amid Russia's invasion. A new threat assessment says Russia-aligned hackers' next goal could be compromising Canada's oil and gas sector, increasing national security concerns as critical infrastructure needs oil and gas to operate. The intelligence agency, the RCMP, and several government departments briefed top energy executives last week on how to guard against these coming cyber attacks. But critics warn that the federal government hasn't followed through on its cybersecurity promises, leaving businesses and Canadians vulnerable to growing threats. Joining me now to talk about this is Sammy Khoury, head of the CSE's Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity. Great to talk to you, Sammy. We don't get to hear from you often, so this is quite a pleasure. Thanks, Mercedes, for having me on the show. Let's start with the oil and gas picture. Obviously, we've seen a lot of concern around this when we look at Europe, Ukraine being cut off, other uh, European countries who supported Ukraine being cut off. But there hasn't been a lot of discussion in the public sphere about Canadian oil and gas being targeted until your report. How have you assessed the threat level for Canadian pipelines and oil and gas companies? Uh, critical infrastructure as a whole is a sector that we're very concerned about. And uh, the, the, we find ways to share information, lots of information. Uh, we do it through advice and guidance. We do it through threat bulletins. Uh, but also we felt the need uh, to connect with the top executives of the oil and gas in Canada and share with them the latest uh, threat landscape. Uh, and that's what we assess is that the threat is real and it's ever present. And it's important that everybody gets sensitized to building resilience in the company because a lot of these companies we rely on for our daily lives. Uh, you talk in this report specifically about sort of two different kinds of threats, those that would come, for example, from Russia as a state or state-aligned uh, actors that Russia is sort of paying to hack with them or who support them, and also those who are doing this for ransom, trying to get money. Can you tell us what a potential attack on Canadian oil and gas would actually look like if it was unfolding in real time? Uh, we've had a taste of that, although not in Canada, but the Colonial Pipeline was an example of an attack on a, a U.S. company. In Canada, the threat we assess is either a threat from cyber criminals, so that would be ransomware, or a threat from nation state, and that would be sort of spying or stealing information. But ransomware can cripple the information systems of a company. And now, it could cripple the corporate systems, but it can also extend to the operational system, which means the pumps, which means the flow of uh, oil or the flow of gas. So the impact could be that a company is essentially crippled from delivering services to Canadian, if need be, uh, that's one way. Or it could put the company in a way, in a, in a holding pattern because their IT is locked and they need to recover from it. So the business uh, continuity will be impacted too. And as you mentioned before, critical infrastructure is, is so many aspects of our life. And I wanted to get into that a little bit because I think we hear critical infrastructure and we think about pipelines or electricity grids, yeah. but it's also banks, your ability to log in and pay your bills. It's being able to pay for gas at the gas station. It's your phone. Yeah. How many people during the Rogers outage couldn't even call 911? Um, this is a really broad segment of vulnerability that could have a, a very real impact on Canadians' lives. Uh, absolutely. I mean, Canada has 10 critical infrastructure sectors, uh, transportation being one of them, the airline companies, the rail, the, uh, the financial, the banks uh, are a critical, uh, finance sector is a critical infrastructure sector. You have transporta sorry, transportation, energy, uh, telecommunication, uh, you have uh, education. So all of these are recognized as critical infrastructure sectors that have an impact on our daily lives. Some are run by big businesses, some are run by uh, um, uh, provinces and or within provincial jurisdictions. So 
everything we do today uh, touch, it touches an aspect of a critical infrastructure, one of those 10 critical infrastructure segments. How damaging could it be if Russia got through and was able to set down, shut down pardon me, multiple sectors at, at once in some kind of a sophisticated, coordinated attack? We're doing a lot to prevent that from happening. Uh, and uh, the, the uh, information sharing, partnering with the private sector, partnering with the provinces is key to what we do at the cyber center. Uh, but we have to recognize that Russia is a sophisticated cyber adversary and they've demonstrated all the way back to 2015 that they can bring down the, the they shut down the power in Ukraine in 2015 and again in 2016. And we throw them throw all sort of destructive capability at Ukraine over the last year. So they have the capability and our uh, role is to stay on top of these things, to see what's happening around the world, to use our intelligence operations uh, in partnership with some of our closest allies to pick up those signals and warn Canadians about them. Do they have the capability to do that to Canada at this point, that kind of a power shutdown? The, the, uh, whether or not they have the capability, the important thing is we need to protect ourselves. I assume uh, we'd only need to protect ourselves, though, if they had that capability, if, if we weren't that far ahead of it. We have, to be, we have to stay one step ahead of them. Uh, but it's not just a technology thing. So yes, we can protect ourselves, but we're living in a very complicated IT world. And we need to protect ourselves against all sorts of threats, but we also need to educate the users at the end. Phishing attacks are also on the rise, and we don't want somebody to click. We might have the strongest IT protection, but if somebody clicks on a link, uh, and that link translates into a phishing attack against the network, uh, that is a weak point. How often would you say attacks happen on Canada, both on government infrastructure and on private infrastructure? Is it a daily event, a weekly event, a couple of times a month? An hourly event. Wow. Uh, so uh, against the government, we have sensors deployed across government. And on an average day, we block between five and six billion uh, signals coming against the government. These are automated systems that are looking for vulnerabilities. Having said that, we hear about incidents in the private sector constantly, and, and every day we have a daily stand-up, and we, we look at you know, who has reached over to us overnight to report an incident. So attacks are of varying degree of sophistication. Some are uh, benign, but some are definitely, when it evolves into a ransomware case, uh, it's very concerning because there is an impact on business, there is an impact on service delivery. I wanted to ask you about TikTok. The federal government has banned it, but a lot of these private companies haven't. So their employees might have it on their phone. Are you concerned about TikTok or other apps that could create a backdoor for that kind of hacking on people's phones who might be handling very sensitive information and critical infrastructure? Uh, TikTok, like many of the other social media app, uh, request from the user an expanded access to a lot of personal information. Uh, the ban in the government was deemed that the, in the aggregate there was a privacy concern that we felt across government that uh, should, should the app should not have access to that. We have issued an, ad, an advisory or a, a advice and guidance bulletin uh, to invite Canadians, to encourage Canadians to look at the settings on their phone, to look at what information are these apps asking for. Uh, and make a personal judgment. We, we, don't, uh, we don't regulate, uh, we don't examine every app. So it's a personal decision and businesses can, absolutely there's a, do, there's a section in the document to look at businesses, uh, sorry, that's cater to businesses that we invite them to look at and assess what is the risk to the business for apps, who, who's behind the app, who has access to the data. Uh, and make a judgment call based on that. Come on, the, the risk to the business could be a risk to Canadians. Just before we go, to help our viewers at home who heard you say, look at the settings on your apps, what should they specifically be looking for that might suggest there's a risk or they, they might want to decline that on their app when they're downloading it and it asks for permissions? M many of the apps uh, ask for access to the contact list, to the calendar, to your um, uh, coordinates, the, your geo coordinates, where you are. You ask yourself the question, why do they need that information, right? Uh, some of it is to deliver a more personalized, uh, so if you're in Ottawa, it will fire an ad uh, because you're in Ottawa. But 
can you live without this? Uh, so ask yourself the question, why does the app request access to that? And if there's a legitimate reason, if the calendar requests access to your contact, that makes sense. But if an app requests access to your geo coordinates, you might want to wonder why is it that they need access to my geo coordinates? And we've, we've issued, again, there's some information on our website uh, that we invite anybody to go and look at and look at how best to configure or look at the privacy setting on their phone. Sammy, thank you for that great advice and for your wisdom today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Mercedes. Happy to be here. Up next, as the House breaks for the summer, taking stock of what did and didn't get done during the last session of Parliament. The House of Commons has wrapped up for the summer, and despite a lot of heated debate on the government's response to foreign interference, among other things, the Liberals say they accomplished a lot. It marks uh, a period of time that despite the noise often that's in Parliament, the Canadians can look at what their Parliament and government achieved uh, and see enormous progress. Did the Liberals manage to emerge victorious? Did the opposition hold them to account here to break down the session that was in the coming political season? Is former Calgary Mayor Nahed Nenshi and Lisa Raitt, former Conservative Cabinet Minister and Vice Chair of Global Investment Banking at CIBC. Great to see you both. Great to see you. Lisa, let's start with you. You know, former Cabinet Minister looking back, remembering what it was like for your government, perhaps eight years into power when things get a little bit hairy. How do you things, think things went uh, for the government and the opposition in this session? Starting with the government, I think they did one really good thing, and that is at least somewhat of a response to the United States Inflation Reduction Act. That is something that's needed not only in the short term, but in the long term for economic growth. So they had a good fair number of measures in their budget, they passed their budget, and now at least there's a signal to the business community and to corporate Canada that they are serious about making sure that they reduce emissions, but they're there to help it. And that I think was a really important win for them. On the opposition side, I think the opposition has done a really great job of trying to rattle the government and really take a look at whether or not as a whole, there's something or they're the entity that you want to be the government in the long term. And what I would point to is I think Pierre Polyev is performing very well in the House of Commons. He gets really good questions in. And you've got a couple of the ministers who are actually on the ropes. And as a result, the opposition would call that a win for the season as well. Nahid, what's your take on how this session went? You know, I, I think about these things a little bit differently sitting here in Calgary. I uh, don't pay as much attention to the cut and thrust of the daily work and try and really look at how are things that are happening really going to impact people on the street every day. Uh, I'll, I'll tell a story in a sec, I think. Well, maybe I'll tell it now. I was in Ottawa a couple of weeks ago and it was I was near Parliament Hill and it was two o'clock and I thought, isn't this when question period is? I've never been to question period. I'm going to go check it out. So I stood in line with all the school children and <laughs> went in to watch question period and it was the day... When the Prime Minister said, I can't remember what it is that Pierre Polyev did before politics. And Pierre Polyev said something uh, quite rude about the Prime Minister's previous life as a teacher. And I was embarrassed for everybody. I was embarrassed for the children on the floor of the House of Commons. I was embarrassed for the school children sitting with me uh, in the gallery. Um, because I know that's not an original thought. But, you know, it kind of shocked me when I was watching it for the first time live that they weren't talking to one another, they were talking to the cameras, that when Mr. Polyev asked his last question, he didn't stick around and wait for the answer. He just fist bumped his colleagues, good job, good job, on the way out and walked out rather than taking two minutes of his life to at least pretend to listen to the answer. So I kind of wonder if when we talk about this sort of thing, we're talking about stuff that doesn't resonate in any way with Canadians. People don't watch question period. And so what I'm interested in is what was actually accomplished. And for me, one of the most interesting things is there were three things done that massively increased the social safety net in Canada. Whether or not you agree with these things, this is probably the largest expansion of social programs in Canada that I've seen you know, since the 80s. And that is the expansion of dental care to children and seniors, the expansion of $10 a day child care, and something we haven't talked about at all, which just passed last week, unanimously in the House of Commons, the creation of the Canada Disability Benefit. And so regardless of the heat and the fire that we talk about day to day in politics, 
this is actually a major shift in how government and community and citizens work together. And I think that the Liberals have done a pretty decent job, whether you agree with them or not, on pushing this agenda pushed forward by their agreement with the NDP. I have to take a moment there to get on my hobby horse here as a news person. I'm sure viewers at home wonder why we don't show things like that, like Pierre Polyev getting up and walking out of the House instead of listening to the end of his question. And the answer is because the House of Commons actually controls the cameras and they are only on the yeah. person speaking. So we're not able to show you <laughs> the stuff that you saw there or that we see sitting up in the gallery uh, about how much of this is, is, is performance. And it's something Aaron O'Toole talked about on the show last week. And he talked about it in his, his final speech to the House of Commons too, that people need to stop using it as just a way to come up with clips for their social media and their YouTube channels. It, it's losing that back and forth debate and thrust. But but, you know, Lisa, there was a, a lot of debate and thrust around foreign interference. It looks like maybe we will have an inquiry now. The government basically had to do a 180 on that uh, after this imploded on them. Your thoughts on how that unfolded for the government and, and whether it's going to jeopardize them in the long term or if this is something that people are going to forget about over the summer? I don't think they're going to forget about um, the fact that we're calling an inquiry. Whether or not the government will be penalized for taking such a long time to get there, Probably not. Uh, I think the inquiry is extremely important because at the very least, Canadians should have some assistance in actually sifting through all of the accusations that have been coming over the past number of months and all of the unveiling of different pieces of information that seems to be coming almost on a weekly basis through you know, a national newspaper and, some, and a handful of television uh, outlets. And I think that is something that is important for, as I said, the Canadian public writ large, to try to get a sense as to what is really going on. Protecting our democracy is incredibly important. And quite frankly, I mean, what it comes down to for me and how I explain it simply when, when somebody asks me what this is all about, in any other country, if you had a report that a member of parliament or a member of your legislative authority or, or assembly was targeted so that they would be pressured to change their minds on how they advocated for a certain issue close to their heart, there would be an uproar. And there should be an uproar in this country for the same thing. Either Jenny Kwan or Michael Chong or Aaron O'Toole. I mean, three sitting members allegedly being pressured in order to stop them from talking negative things about the Chinese government. And as a result, we really need to get to the bottom of it. Ned, your thoughts on that? I very much agree with Lisa that this is a very big deal. And full disclosure, I know and admire David Johnson very much. I sit on a nonprofit board of directors with him and Michael Chong, actually. <laughs> um, and so this is, um, uh, you know, I know that I know the parties involved. And I think the, the problem here is that everybody, the government and the opposition, acted in a deeply unserious way when these allegations were raised. Uh, the opposition saw it as an opportunity to attack the government, to attack Mr. Johnston. Man, it was ballsy. Am I allowed to say that on TV? You are. Of Andrew Scheer and Pierre Polyev to come by afterwards and say, how dare the liberals ruin David Johnson's reputation when they had spent weeks attacking the guy? Um, when you read his report, I'm not sure we need a public inquiry because he's done most of the work. We actually do know, based on the secret stuff that he was able to see what happened, it's just we have to trust him. And the opposition and the government together managed to destroy that trust. So I think the best way forward is, as Lisa says, do another airing of the same thing. And hopefully this time we won't try to destroy the messenger and we'll actually listen to what was said. Because this idea of foreign interference, whether China, Russia, India, this is critical to our democracy. We've got to take it seriously. And as much as it sounds naive, I'd like to take the partisanship out of it and take the whole thing seriously as a threat to our democracy. Elise, I know you, you looked like you didn't agree with part of that. The only thing I didn't agree with is I do think that pertinent information came after Mr. Johnston submitted his finished report. Fair. And I think those were important things, like with respect Aaron to... Um, from Aaron O'Toole, exactly. So that stuff does Fair. need to be put into the whole mix as well. Last question for the two of you. Polls show that the Liberal government is in trouble to some degree. People are, are ready for change, but they're not ready for Pierre Polyev. They're not willing to hand over the reins of power. Lisa, I want to ask you, why do you think it is that Pierre Polyev can't convince people to vote for him if they are ready for a change in government? I think it's really hard for Canadians to 
vote for somebody if they don't know them. I mean, we talk about this period of time where you have to get out there and define your leader and the opposition wants to get out and define the leader in a very negative way at the same time. And that's because Canadians really need to warm up to an individual. That takes time. And in a minority government, you don't really have a lot of time. So I would say for the summer and for the next session that Mr. Polyev is going to have to get out there and somehow figure out how to show himself to Canadians in a, in a light that causes them to get to know him a little bit better. Because you're right, Mercedes, in order for that change vote to crystallize, they need to be comfortable where they're going to put their change vote. Um, and as a result, the, the Conservatives will probably have a path to walk this year and, and they'll figure that out. We just have a few moments left, but uh, Nahid, do you think that the Liberal government is in trouble? Well, you know, we've seen a remarkably static situation in the polls, which will show that if an election were held tomorrow, the Conservatives would get the largest percentage of the popular vote as they did in the last couple of elections. They may get the largest number of seats. They probably would not be able to have a stable government unless they were completely backed up by the bloc, which is not impossible. But for Pierre Polyev to actually break through and win, he needs to do something else. And I've been saying for some months now that you can look at the example of Alberta. You know, this kind of very hard edged conservatism, I've been saying probably was just enough for Danielle Smith. And it was just enough for Danielle Smith. I'm not sure it'll be enough for Pierre Polyev. And if I was going to be really snarky about it, I would say that when you're working on a local campaign, you know whether getting your candidate to more and more doors will help because people like them when they meet them. And sometimes you know that maybe you don't want your candidate in those one-on-one -on -one situations because people like them less when they meet them. And so if I'm Pierre Polyev, I'm thinking this summer not just about getting myself out more, but also what message am I taking, particularly to women and to young people? And is it the same guy we see on the floor of the House of Commons? Or is it a more thoughtful guy who seems more plugged in to what people are really worried about? And that's really what I'd be thinking about this summer if I was him. Has he hit his ceiling with the act he's got going on right now? And is there another act that'll do better for him? Well, that's all the time we have. But thank you both for wrapping our final show with this panel and our political analysis. We'll see you back in the fall. Thank you. Have a happy summer, everyone. Up next, why I think it's going to be an interesting summer in federal politics. And now it's time for our final one last thing of this season. Parliament has risen and party leaders are hitting the road for this summer. They'll be shaking hands and schmoozing. While the Liberals and the Conservatives will be presenting two very different visions of Canada, they do share a common challenge, a trust deficit. Justin Trudeau and Pierre Polyev both need to convince voters that they are in politics for Canadians, and not just for their own party or for themselves. We'll see if they can accomplish that. That's our show for today. Thanks for hanging out with us all season. And thank you to our crew for an amazing show and season. Have a great summer and we'll see you back here in September. <laughs>